What's up, my know-it-alls? Well, it is that time again. That's right. Wednesday morning means that the brand new episode of Moon Knight has dropped, and so I have watched it so that I can recap and review it just for you. So let's get together and get into this episode, Moon Knight, episode four, The Tomb. In episode 4 of Marvel Studios' Moon Knight, The Tomb, Arthur Harrow and his disciples have breached the imprisoned Egyptian deity Amit's tomb. Stephen, Mark, and Layla must find another means of passage. Meanwhile, the events of the previous episode, The Friendly Type, the Ennead, frustrated with Khonshu's latest violation of the sky with his thousand Egyptian knights display, have confined the god of the moon in his Ushabti, that little teeny tiny statue. Can Stephen and Mark prevent the release of Amit, Onto the world without Conchu and the protection of Mr. Knight and Moon Knight. Okay, so this episode had an awful lot of history. I will tell you this: this episode fe- felt very much like a uh, like an episode, uh, or not an episode, like an Indiana Jones movie or Tomb Raider movie. Again, staying with that relic hunter, grave digger type of uh, uh, scenario, archaeology, a lot of history going on and whatnot. Um, ultimately. I really liked everything. Again, the sets are gorgeous. The locations are 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 just unbelievable. So uh, very, very well done. And, of course, the filming itself is amazing. So the episode starts with um, specifically Selim. He's the guy who plays the avatar of Osiris. That's, the, that, that's not the actress, the character. And you see him walking through a hallway. It's funny. It's very reminiscent of, again, those old 90s movies. And um, there's going to be kind of a callback to something like that in just a little bit. And so uh, he's carrying Khonshu's Ushabti, that little teeny statue, and he's walking, and eventually he puts it somewhere, and then he backs up, and what you see is this wall. And the wall, it kind of reminds me a little bit of, in Game of Thrones, there's that scene where they have to the the many-faced god, and you see these pillars, and it's got people's faces. And so it's not that extreme, but you see these little statues, and you're like, man! Tell you what, these the Egyptian gods have been putting pe- putting people away for a while, and I'm like, bro, seriously. Then we cut to um, Layla out in the desert, and she's trying to wake Mark up. When all of a sudden, these attackers, these guys, show up, and they're in a jeep, and she runs and she hides, and she manages to drag Mark's body over this hill, and she gets into the back of the jeep, and she's waiting, and you see him come around, and then she did this really awesome thing, which is Layla's a bad woman. I don't care what everybody says. Yes, Layla's amazing. And what does she do? She takes in classic, uh, uh, if you're ever stuck in a Jeep, kids, you want to look for the flares. Just saying. It worked in Jurassic Park. And apparently it works here. So she kicks the flare and she distracts the guys and they come around and then she manages to throw the flare into the back of their truck. Now, earlier we had we had seen for just a split second the back of the vehicle full of ammo. Which I guess was supposed to inform this moment. It's a little silly because, uh, uh, much like the old myth of the old um, uh, uh, wives' tale, if you will, that uh, you know, smoking a, or throwing a cigarette onto gasoline will cause it to explode. The truth is, the gasoline usually there's usually too much volume in terms of the gasoline, so it ends up being more moist and wet than anything else, which ultimately defeats the purpose. So. Uh, <laughs> And what you get is she throws the flare in the back of the box of of ammo. And I'm like, first off, if bullets could get this hot this quickly and go off, we'd all be in danger from a lot worse than an AR-15 or somebody holding a gun because they would just be going off everywhere, especially anywhere that's hot. So anyway... But yeah, so suffice it to say, the flare goes in, and like a split second later, you have bullets shooting everywhere off because they've all been set off by the heat of this flare. Uh, and so apparently, that also is enough to scare off the people who are attacking them. What you end up with is is Harrow has now forced his people in and said, "Listen, we got to do this. We got to go. If this is what has to happen." And so they're doing that. They're going. They're on their way. Layla and Mark continue on. 
And this is where we get a very interesting conversation between Mark and Stephen. Layla is very much of the mindset that, oh, we're going to need Mark. We've got to defend ourselves. we got to do this and that. And the whole scenario that they're in is very dangerous, obviously. That's more danger is Mark's wheelhouse. Egyptian-y historical stuff is Stephen's warehouse, is a uh, wheelhouse. Anyway, so while they're in the car, Stephen's looking at Mark in the rearview mirror, and he's like, I thought you said when we were done with Conchi, you were going to get out. And Mark's like, I, I can't do that right now because, uh, look, I'm still here, so what are we going to do? All right, I, I got to whatever. And there's a bit of back and forth um, that is really, really funny. So when they arrive at Harrow's camp, um, the entire camp is abandoned, and ultimately they have to, they're going through some stuff, and Mark's searching for some sign of where they may have ended up going, and he has a quick conversation, I'm sorry, not Mark, it's Stephen right now. So Stephen and Mark have a conversation briefly in, obviously, the reflections of one of the tables, and Mark is very much like, oh, really, you got the hots for my wife, this and that, blah, 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 you going to talk to her, what's going on? And uh, and Stephen's like, well, yeah, I'm the one out here. This it's my body, and this and that. And so Mark's like, look, if you touch her, I'm gonna throw us off a cliff or something like that. It's really stupid. And then we get to see what looks like a digging tool of some sort. I think it's more of actually, I think it's more of a spelunking hand, act pickaxe type thing, and it's got blood on it, and the blood leads in a trail. So then we cut to Layla. Try Layla almost kisses Stephen. Stephen eventually awkwardly takes charge of that moment and kisses her very awkward. Like, it's very awkward. It's, I'm watching like, is it? Okay. Anyway. And uh, all of a sudden, as Layla goes down into the thing, into the, into the uh, Amit uh, burial site, all of a sudden, you hear the sound that happens when Mark before Mark changes, but he doesn't. Change. It's like, and he punches himself in the face, and you're like, okay, I get it. Uh, and then a short time later, he comes flying down the stairs at, to where she was at, and uh, you get the idea that he basically threw her in. Then we get our next Easter egg. At least I consider it an Easter egg. If you watched my last episode, then you know. Uh, I'm a big believer that um, we, we're getting a commingling at some point of the character of, uh, well, of, we're getting a connection to Wakanda, this vast connection. So there are two enormous panther statues. I say they're panther statues because if you compare it to the screenshot of the Black Panther statue in Wakanda, very similar construction thought process. Could have been a lion. I don't believe it's a lion. Uh, I believe it's probably more of a panther. It could also be a leopard. You'll know why in just a moment. It's funny because I'm like, I don't want to spoil anything for you, even though literally you're watching a spoiler review. Whatever. Uh, and then so Mark notices this little symbol, and it's the symbol that uh, uh, Layla put there for her father. Uh, and so it's sort of a little, he's there with her, and they have a moment about that and whatnot. And he's like, he'd be so proud of you if he knew how you, how you were standing here and the proof of everything. Uh, and so then... They end up walking, as they're going through some, some areas, Mark's noticing there are six, they finally get into the tomb, there are six different passageways, but they don't make any sense. So he stops and he's looking and he's thinking, and he realizes something and proceeds to draw something. He draws the Eye of Horus. Now the Eye of Horus is different than the Eye of Ra. Big different thing. Even though Horus is technically also another name for them. Whatever. So what he does is he, he points out that this entire place must have been built to look like this. And he proceeds to explain how each of the areas on Horus's, on the eye, look, uh, mean a certain thing and have a certain sort of area that they, uh, so it's like this, this area here is the, is the voice and it's, which is the tongue. And there's another area where with the ear and how these symbol things. Anyway. So they eventually get, he, he figures out, hey, if we're following the voice of Amit, because an avatar is the voice of their, of the God who they serve, then it's got to be down the tongue path. So they go down the tongue path. Again, one of the reasons why you have Steven instead of Mark right now, because Steven's very much, he knows this stuff. Mark would just be run, walking around aimlessly. Uh, and, and so then they set out that way. And as they go in, they come to an area that where it's the mages of the time would have prepared everyone's body to go into the, uh, the, the grave, the tomb. 
and uh, the uh, the eponymous tomb of the episode. Uh, and so they, they you see fresh blood all over the place. Like people have, clearly there's like human remains and what looks like gristle. Ugh, sorry, I was like it's so the idea is just gross. And the, clearly there's a sacrifice area and there are these little uh, vases where the, where you put the interior stuff. And so they're, uh, they're searching all over the place and they find that blood is going in one direction. So they want to find an alternate direction. So Mark happens to look up and he notices there's the, a prep area. It's where the Magi of the time would have prepared all the stuff for the various ceremonies. And he's like, there would have been a door up there. And so they climb, he climbs up there. And uh, when he gets up there, he, you see instructions and you see all the stuff on the door on the walls and whatnot uh it's a very good very 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 good uh representation of everything and as they're searching they begin to hear this clicking and so everybody hides mark's ducks down layla is still down on the ground level so she hides behind one of the sarcophagus deals and then you see what looks like this golem esque Egyptian troll thing, little guy who's in stuff and he's kind of slinking and dragging something. And he's dragging, dude, he's dragging the guy with the beard who's a police officer who works for Haro. And he, and the guy's like, oh, don't hurt me, whatever. And he throws him up onto the thing, picks up this really wicked looking, I don't know, e Egyptian scalpel. No, it's designed so you, you put something and hook and hook things up and whatnot. Anyway, and so he proceeds to start taking, removing body parts or organs from this guy and putting them in the little vase things. Uh, clearly, whatever, out of respect for whatever going on. Anyway, so this is one of those cursed type uh, creature thingies. Uh, and so Layla <laughs> accidentally bumps... Because, of course, why wouldn't you? Uh, a vase. And so then that proceeds to Dave start chasing. And Mark sees the whole thing. And he's like, I, I, he has to figure out what to do. And so ultimately, what does he want to do? He wants to help. So he makes a sound. The creature starts climbing. She makes a sound and goes the other direction. They split and go two different ways. Mark heads down the exit that's above that they were looking for. She heads forward onto the main way to go. Of course, we have Flare prepared Layla. Always ready with a flare because that seems to be the way to go. And she gets to this area. You can see there's another door across the way, and she has to go across the edge because, again, obstacles and whatnot. And she's climbing the thing, and the floor gives out in some areas, and she's staying on it. And then you catch a glimpse as she's doing one of these moves through the crags of the rock. This creature is climbing. So you see Layla pass by, and then a split second later, behind her, or not behind her, on the other side of the rock where there's a, where there's a cut through, you see the, the thing come across the, the little area also, and you're like, oh my goodness, she's being chased. And then, so she makes it to the other side. Oh, so as she's getting ready to step onto the main platform, the thing, like this zombie hand comes out this, and is like searching around, and she's like, <gasps> and she jumps. And then just then, right out of this crag in the side, the thing grabs her and she's <laughs> it's total jump scare town uh it's not bad and uh, so as she's facing this thing uh it it's like trying to get her and it's really it's terrible and the thing looks it looks rough it looks real rough it's it's essentially some sort of an egyptian -y zombie thing an egyptian zombie guardian whatever but layla has those flares and so what does she do? She takes the flare, she lights it. Uh, it's one of those flares, you just bang on the thing and it lights up. And then she shoves the flare into the zombie Egyptian guy's head. Uh, and then manages to flip her and him over the edge. And then, of course, because Disney, her hands are on the edge and she pulls herself up. Which is, by the way, a much more difficult thing to do than people might think. That's when she gets back on the ledge. She looks back and you see Arthur Harrow just standing there. Just chilling. And he wants to have a conversation with her. Meanwhile, down below, Mark has managed to make it into the tomb that they were looking for. Now, during this conversation between Layla and Dude, what you get is a really interesting... Um, she doesn't want to have anything to do with him, and she thinks he's full of crap. And so he's like, you know, so she's like, I'm leaving. And that's when he shouts after her. He's like, you know, your father, uh, uh, his little scarab. Is that right? Yeah, that's what he used to call you. And uh, he explains how his powers work. He explains that essentially 
Um, from time to time, or he sees Amit shows him good and evil events and whatnot, and he would he got this information that he's about to divulge to her from when he did the weight and scales thing with Mark. Uh, sorry, Stephen at the time, and so he reveals to her he was present. Your father was killed by mercenaries. He was present, and she she looks ashen like she's not even hearing it, and she kind of uh, walks off. And doesn't want to hear anything more he has to say. Meanwhile, back in the tomb, what you find out is, uh, as, Mark's, as Mark was reading the, the various inscriptions, he finds out it's Mesopotamian, not Egyptian. And it immediately informs the fact that this is the tomb. Amit's avatar was Alexander the Great. Because why not? Uh, so yeah, so Colin Farrell's in there. I'm kidding. If you remember the, if you remember Alexander the movie, Colin Farrell plays the part. Anyway, uh, and so he manages to push the thing aside, and he's looking, and he's coming to the conclusion that if you're the voice, where would you hide the Ushabti for, uh, for Amit? Sure enough, if you're the voice, Mark opens the mummy's face covering, and breaks his its jaw and reaches on down its gullet. That's right. He reaches down there and uh, is starting to search. And then Mark manages to successfully pull out Amit's Yushabti. And there's a little teeny stone statue with the head of a, of, a, of a gator and whatnot. And he's pretty amazed by it. Anyway, Layla comes around the corner and Mark's like, we got it. We won. He's all excited and ecstatic. And she goes, she beelines it right for him. And it's like, can he hear me? And she starts telling him, it's like, what did you do? This and that, blah, blah. And next thing you know... He, because of the emotional distress, clearly this has caused, it's enough to break Steven's control. And then he does a quick little quick shift and Mark is there and he's like, let's, let's talk, let's talk, let's talk, hold on, let's hold on a second. And he's trying his best to talk his way through it. And she's like, what? And it comes out, he didn't kill her father, but his partner, who was overzealous and was trying to betray him, did. And when he did... Um, Mark was also shot, but that's not important in this moment. Uh, it's essentially this, it's the, it's the story. It's the origin story. So like what, so what Marvel has always consistently done is the origin of a thing is not as important as the thing itself. The origin of it, because if we get hung up then you end up with a million origin story movies and we didn't, and nobody got time for that. So everybody, everyone jumps into comic books where they are. And that's kind of what Marvel's been trying to do. So, so in, in like fashion, we don't actually get Mark slash Steven's origin story. What we get is the explanation of the origin story. And it does, it lines up with the comics for sure, which is on an expedition of some kind. He was, he was hired as muscle. Someone, the, the guy, the other, one of the other guys who was there to protect them also betrays them. And so when he betrays them, kills everyone, uh, Mark is left for dead. And ultimately that's when Kanshu shows up and makes Mark the deal. Okay, so again, that's the ult ultimate origin story from the comic books, from uh, Werewolf by Night, which is where the original story. No, I, actually, I think it's from the original. That's from the comic. Forgive me. That's from the wrong. It's from one of the other lines of uh, of, of comics. Uh, Arthur Harrow shows up. Layla's hiding, and Harrow wastes no time. Um, of course, Mark tries to fight because he's an idiot. Because I'm sorry. It's like ten guys with guns, and you no longer have Kanshu protecting you. And I don't care how good how good of a mercenary you are; those odds really suck. Um, and suffice to say, Haro shoots him twice, and he falls backward into water. Uh, as he falls backward into the water, he begins to sink, and he goes farther and farther and farther until a light, distant light, shows up, and he disappears. And then the aspect ratio changes. Now we get back to that '90s callback I told, I promised you guys before. <laughs> It's this totally campy movie of the week style uh, action adventure thing that could have belonged in the uh, uh, action pack, which was one of the UPN. Uh, UPN was one of the TV stand networks at the time. Uh, it was like it was the same thing with it was Andromeda, Xena, Hercules, another show with Bruce Campbell of some kind, whatever. And so I could totally see this show smack in the middle of all that. Anyway, and it's. Professor Stephen, Dr. Stephen Grant, who's searching for lost treasure. And, of course, he's got his little sidekick, who's a native of some sort. And it's great. It's corny and campy as can be. And then we back out of that, and you find out that it's a VCR video being watched in a psych ward. That's right. This is a 
clean white area. The tiles are white. The walls are white. The doors are white. The furniture is white. The trolley that they take medications are white. Um, both of the police officers that we know, the black lady and the um, and the gentleman with the beard, are both in this air. Uh, their orderlies. So you're like, what's going on? And there's little teeny callbacks to. Um, uh, a whole bunch of stuff. And so what you end up with is that the... So there was an interview that happened, uh, it's on, I think it's on Marvel.com. The head writer and executive producer, Jeremy Slater, said that there was never any hesitation about killing off Mark and Steven. And that's awesome. He said specifically, he says, I knew a show like this needs big swings and it needs to take the audience by surprise. What's more surprising than killing off the main character? Of course. But uh, at least wherever Mark and Steven are, wherever they're doing... They've already made a friend. And so that is the, uh, that's really fun. Uh, so what you end up with is, okay, you see imagery everywhere. Everything looks like something else. And you see, and so from previous episodes. And ultimately, you end up with Mark being, he's somewhat drugged and you can tell he's been tranquilized or whatever and it's maybe wearing off or something. And he's brought in front of his therapist and the therapist looks like Arthur Harrow, it's Ethan Hawke playing a therapist and the therapist has there's Egyptian stuff and he's got decorations and every, all this stuff that he's got a cane but it's not the goofy cane it's not the the Amit cane it's a regular one but the fact is the cane exists he can see in the reflection the shoes and for a minute I I was like oh my god are they are they mind effing us that bad like are they genuinely going to screw with us so hard that we're and I could I find myself questioning is the whole show made up? Layla's there, but she's a patient and she's eating her marshmallows. And there's all these little things, these little Easter eggs from the series itself. So that was pretty awesome. And ultimately what you end up with is you find, now you start to find out that it's actually more in his head than anything else. Um, so he manages to escape. He uh, escapes the, the, the place and he ends up hiding in a room where there's another sarcophagus. He opens sarcophagus. It's Steven. Mark and Steven meet for the first time and they hug. It's one of the most genuine moments. And it's straight out of, um, it's straight out of uh, Lanier's run uh, on Moon Knight, which it, Jeff, Jeff Lemire's run on Moon Knight. Um which is definitely a, it's a cool little Easter egg and I love it. And I think it's really neat. And it's funny because if you remember back to episode one, when he's in the storage place and I, and there's a little QR, maybe it's episode two, there's a little QR code. The QR code brings you to this run of Moon Knight. So a lot of this, this particular, uh, this series is really based on this run, which is the 2016, 2018 Moon Knight comic book run for those of you playing at home. Uh, or if you're looking for it digitally, I think I know they. I think they've got it on Mar Alt Marvel Unlimited. Unli yeah, Marvel Unlimited, which is their comic book reading stuff, whatever. Um, and uh, uh, it's pretty cool. So it's uh, it's one of those things I thought was really neat. And then of course, as him and so Mark and Stephen <laughs> go rush out and they get into a door and you see a giant hippo. Because why wouldn't you see a giant hippo? And uh, this is actually the representation of the Egyptian god or goddess uh, Taweret, which is a hippo-based uh, god. And I say hippo-based god. Um, it's the Egyptian goddess of childbirth. And uh, uh, she's also the, uh, the wife of Bes, which is the god of luck and probability, something like that. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, she's, uh, she's pretty cool. And so <laughs> it's a startling moment, but it looks dope. That's how the episode ends. So, yeah. Okay. What are we going to give this episode? The, uh, the, of Moon Knight episode four, uh, the know it all index. I'm going to say, I really, I enjoyed the episode. I'm going to give it an eight out of 10, eight out of 10. I liked it. I liked it. I liked it a lot. I enjoyed it. There wasn't a whole lot of action, but it was still, it was good. It was really good. And there was more character development, and they managed to make me question my reality by the fact that Mark and Steven are dead now. And so, and again, most of this comes out of the comics. Comics are comics. You guys are going to love it. So we have a couple more episodes left. There's two more episodes. Next week is the penultimate episode, and the week after that is the uh, series finale. I say series finale because it looks like we're only going to get one season of Moon Knight. I'm okay with that. Limited series, 
down, man. That's how the TV's been done in the UK forever. So I'm all about it. Comment below. Let me know what you think about the episode. Did you enjoy it? Did you enjoy seeing all the various parts of this thing um, come together the way they have? I, I've been, I'm enjoying the yarn they're spending a lot. This has been a lot of fun. It's been a good fun ride, and I can't wait to see kind of where it goes. I ultimately see where Moon Knight goes as a character, because even though... This is, a, this is a limited series. Every possibility you could see him pop up somewhere else again. So, um, yeah, really enjoying this era of the of Phase Four uh, and whatnot. So, yeah, man, uh, there you go. Now you know. And if knowing is half the battle, you're halfway to being a know-it-all yourself. Comment below, like the video, subscribe, and of course, click the notification the bell icon to be notified. All right, you guys. I'll see you next week. Never forget, everyone loves a know-it-all.